All right. The Transmogrification of Wamba's Revenge by H.L. Gold. Watch out, you gross giants. We pygmies are on the march, and tomorrow, Earth is ours. As I sit here writing this in a deluxe suite of the famous but resounding Waldorf Astoria, I can look out the fourth floor window and see the people below resembling the scurrying warrior ants of my native Africa. It was a Monday because the other married women were down at the river, beating their laundry on flat rocks when Mr. Lunding, the local white hunter, came into our compound with the two truck safari. What cheer, Wumba? Why are you not at river wash clothes? I nodded hello, ignoring his deliberate insult. He knew perfectly well that I spoke English, having graduated from Bennington College for Women, and that, as daughter of the super chief of all the pygmies and number one wife of the head witch doctor, I was exempt from menial tasks. Worry on you, Amba. He continued with his atrocious accent and the vocabulary of a retarded three-year-old while climbing out of his Land Rover. We think you grow one or two inch since last time. Oh, he was an expert needler. And he touched me at my proudest spot. The women of all our tribes didn't envy me my status which they and I had grown up with, but there wasn't one of them that wouldn't maim herself to be my height, a good three inches shorter than any other full-grown pygmy adult. It was difficult, but I kept silent. The tribe's whole cash crop came from London safaris, and I mustn't jeopardize it no matter what. My father, the super chief came out of the council hut, followed by my husband, the head witch doctor, just as an oldish young man clambered down from the other vehicle and handed out a woman in jod purse. Welcome, welcome, cried my father in English I had taught him with no little pain. He was a terrible linguist. Great honor, very great, welcome. My husband, the head witch doctor, stood waiting for the introductions. And Lundine obliged using all the appropriate titles, including mine. The oldest young man was a Professor Todd and the woman in Jodhpur's was his wife. We shook hands all around ours being small and dry, theirs being large and moist. You come to hunt? Asked my father politely, using up the last of his English. No way, said the professor. You've heard of penicillin, quinine, digitalis? Yes. We use them all the time. Really? No masks or dances to drive away evil spirits? My husband's eyes did not waver an inch. Of course, faith is part of the healing process. Well, the I'm here to... Yes, yes. I'm here to look for more such species in the soil, the barks, the berries, leaves, everything. I have a laboratory on wheels and I do hope you people will help me in my search. What did he say? The super chief asked, I translated and he said, 
what's in it for us. Honor. Said the witch doctor. Whatever squeezes through my fingers, said Lundine, both in pygmy, then in pseudo-British English, Lundine said, I say, Professor, why don't you show our loyal host your laboratory while I show Mrs. Pods the compound? Blend it. This way, please. I followed the three men, but kept looking back over my shoulder. Just as I expected, the white hunter was charming the professor's wife, a scene I had witnessed every time there was a giddy female in a safari. This time, however, he was bold to the point of contempt, a fact that was not lost on the professor who stopped at the steps of the traveling laboratory and looked after the pair. She was holding Lundine's upper arm in both her hands and smiling dizzily up at him. I saw the pain cross the professor's face before he turned and ushered us into the air-conditioned laboratory. Bless me. Said my husband in awe while my father whistled. As for myself, I had seen labs of one sort or another, but nothing so marvelously compact and complete as this. I said so, and Professor Todd's face lit up with pride. Thank you. Mr. Lundin told me of your American education princess and your work, doctor, at the hospital in Mabuti. And he assured me that you both would be invaluable to our mission. We are yours to command. Good, good. And you can help me organize your people into work parties. Each group to collect whatever it's assigned to ferns, soils, barks, and so forth. You, princess, will be my lab assistant. And you'll need a cleaning woman twice a week, I said. No, no. Miss, Mr. Lundine wouldn't trust anyone but you to keep things clean and orderly. Well, we're practically in business right now. Yes. In one way or another, Mr. Lundin always gives us the business. My father had been following all this with great difficulty. Now he asked me what the arrangements were. I told him. You mean that you, the princess, are to be a housemaid? Oh, I forbid it. What seems to be the difficulty? He's a stickler for pr protocol. We'll straighten it out with Mr. Lundine. Good, good. We don't want any hurt feelings. Now, doctor, I need to know how many able-bodied people you have. So we can set up work parties. Looking back over what I have written, I feel terribly unlike a professional writer. I haven't, for example, told you all I knew about the white hunter, that he came from Ohio, but wouldn't wear, drive, or talk anything but British. His owning a Land Rover instead of a Jeep was completely characteristic. You mustn't think he was typical of white hunters. He wasn't typical of anything but a greedy, selfish, overbearing opportunist, a phony who loved to humiliate us because we couldn't hit back, 
and we couldn't hit back because no other white hunter bothered with us. They used to, but that was before Lundin arrived. I don't know what to add about Professor Todd. He was the average dedicated scientist who, for no discernible reason, happened to be married to a vain, stupid woman younger than himself. I see that I've given Mrs. Todd only one line of dialogue, when in fact she was anything but inarticulate, in a nasty, bored sort of way, except I soon discovered when she was alone with an admirer, or thought they were alone. I made a point of watching her in Lundy, for my people's sake, of course. I wanted them to be paid for their work and come to think of it, mine too, because so much depended on it. Which brings me to our tribal setup. It was commonly known that we pygmies were primitive nomads, but I've never encountered anyone who knew that the central tribe, ours was not. The satellite tribes all visited us in turn for whatever meager trading we could do, but mainly for treatment of their and our sick and aged. The white hunter was essential to this because he brought us medicines for which he extorted every last penny he allowed us to make from his safaris. Chapter two. Things are going just beautifully, Princess. The work parties would have overwhelmed me if not for your help with the tagging and classifying. I've never seen anyone pick up details as fast as you, unless it's your husband. A lot he knew. Between that fathead Lundine and that insipid idiot, Mrs. Todd. The tribe was on the verge of mutiny, medicines or no medicines. With her hanging adoringly onto his arm, he would needle the work parties in his execrable pygmy so that they had either to strangle him or work off their anger on their jobs. Then when Professor Todd came up, he could only compliment Lundin for their zeal. The work parties were organized into squads, with each squad searching for a different thing, like soil samples, fungi, roots, berries, and so on. And they worked in each other's footsteps, going away from the compound, between two lines of rope, which my father and husband laid out differently each day. After leaving the parties to the head witch doctor and the super chief, the two would come to the lab and work me over. They knew none of us could complain to the professor, so we were safe targets. Lundin's favorite stunt was to ask me to wipe things far over my head which I had to reach by standing on a lap stool and making me clean out the animals' cages. Todd didn't know what was going on because the orders were in pygmy. Then Mrs. Todd would say, Princess, darling, would it be too much trouble to light my cigarette? And I would, and she'd blow smoke in my face when Todd's back was turned. I had never felt such hatred before, nor could I vent it on anyone or anything. My husband and father had their own troubles, one treating the rebellious with tranquilizers and the other with orders to obey instructions and ignore the needling. All this was going through my mind when I saw Professor Todd peering at me at eye level. I've been driving you too hard. You look tired. Tired? 
I was exhausted working all day and staying up all night to keep an eye on Mundine and Mrs. Todd. And I hadn't gotten anything more incriminating on my little battery powered tape recorder than some slurping noises that I knew were kisses. But that wouldn't convince anyone else. Neither of the pair was brainy enough to be so circumspect. There had to be some reason for each staying in his own guest hut all night. I thought I knew what it was, so I let my shoulders and face slump and mumbled something about duty and honor. I know how you feel. I feel the same way about saving lives. Professor Todd said, leading me firmly out of the laboratory. But one has one's duty to oneself too, you know. I want you to take the day off and sleep. Yes, professor, I said obediently. I could sleep for days. And take tomorrow off as well. He said, taking me to my hut, and he wouldn't leave until I pretended to doze off. Night, night. Sleep tight. He whispered, leaving on tippy toes. Take my word for it. It was almost more than I could do not to fall asleep. But I had to stay awake. What a nice guy, I thought. How could he have stayed married to this queen of the stag line? Did she, to quote Mad Avenue, was buried? I didn't know, but I'd intended to find out. When I was sure Professor Todd was inside his lab and unlikely to look outside, I slipped out with my tape recorder and searched for the miscreants. As I suspected, they were nowhere in the compound. The Land Rover also was gone. I followed the freshest tire tracks out of the compound. I was worried for the moment about being seen by the work parties, but the tracks led off in the opposite direction. Settling down to what was, for a pygmy and a woman at that, and a woman three inches shorter than any other adult pygmy to boot, a steady lope, I kept listening for the Land Rover and watching the ground for tracks leading off the rutted jungle road. Put yourself in my place. Wouldn't you expect them to drive miles away and get off the trail so they wouldn't be surprised by a passerby? Oh, contraire. That was expecting too much of these nasty specimens. For I came upon the vehicle as I rounded a bend barely 15 minutes from home. I slipped up on its blind side, hung my microphone on a toppling rope and paid out wire as I backed off the road into the jungle. Screened by a bush, I could hear very clearly what was going on as I switched on the machine. Now do you believe me, you mad, impetuous boy? I told you I love you. How many ways are there of convincing you? You could tell me why you married him in the first place. Why, it's obvious, sweetheart. Everybody expects him to win the Nobel Prize. So that's why you came along on this expedition came along. I took him away from teaching at the university, bought him the best portable lab money could buy, financed the whole safari. What? You mean you didn't know I'm filthy rich? You loved me for myself alone? I could practically hear the white hunter's excuse for a brain going into reverse. Knowing him from many safaris, I could tell he had been about to say, through a stiff upper lip, that he'd marry her in a minute, if not for his 
fictitious wife and tots at home who needed him and the little money he brought in from his safaris. Of course I didn't know. But what difference would it have made? Me, a lowly... Don't say it. You're a fine, handsome, intelligent man, and I can't stand another day with that creep, even if he does win the Nobel Prize. Then let's leave him here. Without his laboratory, so he can't follow us. But would you consent to be my, my wife? Dearest, I would. And you won't have to be a white hunter unless you want to be. Not without you. He vowed piously. I believed him. He wouldn't let all that money go unguarded. Well, so much for evidence. I had all I needed. So I stowed away the microphone and wire and headed back to the compound. They came in an hour later and made for Lundin's hut. I waited till they started packing his campaign chest, then went into the hut with two glasses, a bottle of scotch and a soda bottle on a tray. Dash it all, princess, you're full of surprises. One must do what one must do, I said meekly. I had sort of been looking forward to our daily snit about bringing us drinks. I, I don't leave much, leave you much choice, do I? None at all. Darling, you're so masterful. This is Todd was saying as I left. I went back to my hut and took out the treasure chest I kept under my bunk. My Barbie and Kendall clothing were at the top. I took them out and then gathered all the rags I could find and returned to Lundin's hut. It was the <laughs> sickest night I had ever spent. Thank you. This is a completion of episode one for the transmogrification of Wombless Revenge.